Take a moment and breathe deeply. Take a deep breath in. Breathe in God's love. And then breathe out all the cares that you brought today to this service. Breathe in God's peace. Breathe out hope for the future. All of who you are today, all of what you brought, your joys, your fears, your questions, your sorrow, all of who you are is welcome in this space. Good morning, my name is Reverend Kathy Morse. I am the outreach minister at uh, Renton United Methodist Church, and I'm here because our pastor Michelle is on vacation this week. So I want to welcome all of you, those who are here in the sanctuary, those who are watching online, welcome you to this worship service and invite you to let go of anything that you brought with you and, um, and be open to whatever happens in the next hour. In this season of Easter, we're going to talk about pilgrimage and, um, and pilgrimage as a spiritual discipline. And so there are many ways to enter into a pilgrimage, and today we'll talk about just one of those that starts with our doubts, and they are totally reasonable. So if you have doubts about the faith, hold on to them during this service, and we will talk about them. I invite you to rise as you are able in body or spirit, for the call to worship. Peace be with you. And also with you. As we settle into God's presence, God calls us by name and invites us to believe. We believe, O oh God, thou art unbelief. As we enter into Christ's resurrection story, Christ offers us the fullness of life everlasting. As we enter into this time of worship, the Spirit blesses us with a holy calling. May we live as disciples, serve as Jesus served, love as God loves, and offer new life as Christ has offered new life to us. Our opening hymn this morning is Christ Has Risen. It's on page 2115 in the black, small, thin black hymnal. Tom? Till Christ 
Christ in their conversation breaking bread and sharing wine. Christ has risen from forever, lives to challenge and to change all whose lives are messed or mangled. Christ is risen, Christ is present, making us what he has been, evidence of transformation in which God is known and seen. And you may be seated. Good morning. I am Nancy Cook, your liturgist this morning, and I would really like for you to join me in today's opening prayer. Christ, our living hope, breathe your spirit upon us, fill us with your faith and love, that we may believe and live the Easter miracle. Help us so to believe where we have not seen, that others will see us, the living Christ, arisen and changing the world even today. In faith and hope we pray. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Keep in heaven, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen.
made fresh. I'm not sure this is working. Now? There? Okay. It's time for the word made fresh and I would invite all the children to come up but there aren't any. And um, that seems to happen when I am in charge of word made fresh. So I don't know if they got the message or what. But if, you, if you'd like to see the word made fresh, we can do that anyway. Yes? Okay. All right. Well, I am, I am inviting uh, my husband, Steve, to come up. And, and um, he's going to stand over here. Oh, uh, you might want to move. You want me to move? Yeah, you might move back here. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, I, I have a... Um, uh, a Wow, I need to start over again. <laughs> One of the things about our spiritual disciplines is that we have to practice them frequently, um, that we have to have a pretty regular practice. And one of the things that best illustrates that for me is a yo-yo. Um, and so Steve has a yo-yo here. And um, I know, isn't that good? Do some more, do some more. <laughs> While I talk, you can just keep doing the yo-yo. And now I can't do that. And, uh, and, and the reason that I can't do that is because uh, it never comes back up for me. And it just kind of, what happens if you don't pull it back up, Steve? I can't make it stay down. Well, Steve, Steve obvious, oh, oh, there you go. There you go. And, and that's, that's true of our spiritual lives. It's important for us to come back to God's hand every day because that's where the energy comes from. Just like the energy for the yo-yo comes from the string coming back up into the yo-yo. There's probably some physics thing there that I don't understand. <laughs> what? What's it called? Gravity? gravity? <laughs> no. Stored the gravity energy. makes it just go down and hang there. It's... It's stored kinetic energy, isn't it? It's stored kinetic energy. Thank you, Steve. Stored kinetic energy. We can have stored spiritual energy. And it, it, we get that by coming back to God's hand every day. So, um, and we can do that many times during the day. It doesn't have to be a long time. It doesn't have to be 30 minutes. It can be five minutes. It can be two minutes of just reconnecting with God so that our spiritual energy flows and we can be um, we can do what we were meant to do, just like the yo-yo does what it's meant to do when somebody knows what they're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Yay. Good job, good job. Yeah. <laughs> oh, are we done now? Okay. Oh, okay. There. I think that's better. <laughs> <clears throat> Would you stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel? We are uh, John 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said, had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of his nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you had been alive that first week after Jesus was crucified, would you have been one of the believers or one of the skeptics? If you had been a follower of Jesus, would you have believed the stories you were hearing? Or would you have needed to see with your own eyes? If you had been one of the 10 disciples to whom Jesus appeared on that first night, would you wonder if what you thought you experienced was true? Are there other biblical stories and claims that do not make sense to your 21st century mind? It may be helpful to remember that there are a number of mythic stories in the Bible that were understood by their first hearers and those who listened to them for centuries later as stories that were never meant to be factual, but were intended to convey something true about the human experience of God or what it means to be human. Some of those stories attempt to answer big existential questions like, where did we come from? Or why do bad things happen to good people? It wasn't until the Enlightenment that we began to read the Bible literally. Some miraculous stories have always had more power for people of faith. And it's some of those very stories that drive skeptics away from the faith. I think a healthy skepticism is a good thing. It means that we're using, using our God-given ability to think and reason. I can't imagine that the creator of the vastness and wonder of space and the extraordinary diversity of just the part of the world that we can see, and the complexity of the structures that we're still discovering too small for the human eye. I can't believe that God would want us to leap blindly to some belief that doesn't make sense, to the incredible minds that we are given. So my rule of thumb is, if some part of the scripture or the tradition doesn't make sense to me, after applying the tools of careful reading, the wisdom of my peers, my own experience, and thoughtful reasoning, I think of it as the bones that are left after I eat a piece of chicken. The bones are still chicken, but they are not nourishing or helpful to me. Sometimes I'll find that something that has not made sense becomes crystal clear 
when the tradition is discarded and I read through a new lens. But that's a topic for another day. Today, I want to affirm any healthy skepticism that you have had about claims of the Christian faith. I am grateful to John's Gospel for preserving this story of healthy skepticism and doubt. Good for Thomas. He's the kind of guy who would proclaim that the emperor has no clothes to mix parables. And we need clear-eyed skeptics to keep our faith in church real and relevant. On the back of Brian McLaren's book, Faith After Doubt, is this helpful insight. Questions and doubt are not the enemy of faith, but rather a portal to a more mature and fruitful kind of faith. So I invite you into a portal of into a portal to a more mature and fruitful kind of faith this morning. Here's the bottom line for me. I don't need to believe in everything that scripture or the faith claims about Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus, I just need to believe that what he said was true and trust that what he said will work in my life. For example, I don't need to believe in the virgin birth to follow Jesus. I do need to believe that Jesus, what Jesus said about loving my neighbor as much as I love myself. Meaning I believe your child needs as good an education as mine does and I will support public education. I don't have to believe that Jesus could turn water into wine, but I do believe that the plain, ordinary gifts that I offer can become beautiful, healing, joy-filled, and celebratory through the power of love. I might not be able to wrap my brain around whatever happened in the resurrection, but I can be so committed to loving God and my neighbor and to the cause of justice that I'm willing to pour out my life every day, even to the point of risking my life. The amazing part of today's reading that gives me hope when I doubt is Jesus's willingness to show Thomas what he showed the other disciples. That's a demonstration of the generosity of God's love. But for some of us, even this story may be in the realm of the questionable. What I hear in this story is God's grace-filled demonstration of new life for Thomas, a portal into a more mature and fruitful faith. So I'm grateful for every demonstration of the possibility of new life that I encounter. It may be as ordinary as new leaves on the trees or tulips bursting out of the cold, dark earth. When I have failed in some way, big or small, I am looking to the amazing miracle of butterflies. You know that they decompose in their cocoon completely into a liquid and become the butterfly that emerges later? And that's, that's why it's one of our basic symbols of resurrection. I look to the miracle of sunrises after long dark nights and the new life that springs up through volcanic ash. I'm grateful for any sign of new life, no matter how odd it may be. So let me tell you one of those odd true stories. When our son was in high school, his girlfriend's mother worked in a veterinarian's office. A couple brought their dog, Turkey, to the vet to have it put to sleep because Turkey dug in the yard. The vet didn't have the heart to put down a beautiful dog for such a petty reason. And the dog was beautiful. The vet had extra kennel space and decided to try to find the dog a new home. In the meantime, the vet had an opening in his schedule and decided to clean the dog's teeth. During the procedure, un under anesthesia, the dog died. The vet did everything he could to save Turkey. He did CPR, gave him mouth to snout resuscitation, but nothing worked. Sadly, the vet and his assistant zipped the dog into a burial bag. Just as they were putting the bag into the freezer, the dog woke up. Amazed, the vet kept the dog several days to check for brain damage and finally released him to the home his assistant found, our home. 
We just couldn't call such a beautiful dog Turkey. Duke, the wonder dog, lived with us for many years and was our beloved friend. If he were here today, he would quietly sit next to you and put his beautiful head in your lap. As skeptical as I sometimes am, and that's a good thing, it is also good for me to encounter realities that are a mystery to me and to simply hold those mysteries as a sign of God's presence and love. Even when all of a story doesn't make sense to me, I know that it is a true testimony to someone's real experience of God, of God's real presence. I often come back to a prayer written by Chuck Wilhelm, a lay person at the two-year Academy for Spiritual Formation, as a reminder of the many ways that God chooses to reveal God's grace-filled presence. This is Chuck's prayer. I pray that Christ may come to you early in the morning, as he came to Mary that morning in the garden. And I pray that you find Christ in the night when you need him, as Nicodemus did. May Christ come to you while you are a child, for when disciples tried to stop them, Jesus insisted that the children come to him. I pray that Christ may come to you when you are old, as he came to old Simeon's arms and made him cry, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen. And may Christ come to you in grief, as he did for Mary and Martha when they lost their brother. May Christ come to you in joy, as he did to the wedding in Cana. And may Christ visit you when you are sick, as he did for the daughter of Jairus, and for so many who could not walk, nor stand straight, nor see, nor hear, till he came. May the Lord Jesus come in answer to your questions, as he once did for a lawyer and a rich young ruler. And in your madness, may he stand before you in all his power as he stood among the graves that day before Legion. May Christ come to you in glory upon your dying day, as he did to the thief hanging beside him that Good Friday. And though you seldom come to him, and though you often make your bed in hell as I do, may you find Christ descending there, where the apostles in their creed agreed he went, so you would know there is no place he would not come for you. As we sing our closing hymn of dedication, or not our closing hymn, our hymn of dedication, let it be about believing what does make sense to you and holding a space to be surprised by the mystery. Our hymn of dedication is found in the United Methodist Hymn, number 328, Surely the Presence of the Lord. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I can feel his mind. 
May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Wait a minute. I think you're going to have to pray all by yourself for a minute because I can't seem to find my prayer. And that's the truth. Well, we'll just do the best we can. One more time. Just let me look through real quick. Nope. All right. Now let's pray. God of grace, we give you thanks for your presence that is always with us. We give you thanks that you hold us. Whether we know that we are being held or not, we give you thanks for your faithfulness, that you are always there, that you are always loving us, that you are always wrapping around your indescribable love for us and for our neighbors. And then you invite us to speak our needs to you in spite of the fact that you already know our joys and our fears, our questions and our sorrow. Yet you hear our prayers of petition for ourselves and for others. This morning, we lift up Dave, who has had surgery, and give thanks that he is now able to be home. We give you thanks that he has experienced your presence all along the way and ask for his continued healing over a long haul. We pray for Norm, because Thursday he's having cataract surgery. We pray for a successful surgery that brings him better sight, not less. And we pray for Tony Hickinson and the Hickinson family, co-worker and friend of Katrina Jones. Prayers on a good fight through brain cancer treatment. And prayers for his family and friends on the loss of a great supporter of all as he goes through this treatment. Give us courage, O God, to address the gun violence in our nation. Give us wisdom. We lament the loss of so many lives. And now we name within our own hearts our deepest concern. As we gather all of these prayers, those that have been spoken and those that have remained within the silence of our hearts, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite Diane Rogerson up for our offering moment. Native American Ministries Sunday is one of the six special offerings we take each year. Native American Sunday reminds us of the gifts and the contributions made by all the Native Americans to our society. 
This spatial offering helps to support Native American outreach within the conferences and the United States. It provides seminary scholarships for Native Americans who might not be able to afford their schooling. The money will also help to support the ministries and churches in the Native American communities and allow the Methodist Church to partner with existing Native ministries to develop new programs on behalf of the Native Americans. I'm letting you know today that next Sunday the 23rd is the official date for Native American ministries. So I hope you can spend this week in prayer and come prepared to make a donation. I would like to end with the Indian Great Spirit Prayer. O oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the winds, and whose breath gives me, gives life to all the world, hear me. I come before you, one of your children. I am small and weak. I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in beauty and make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Amen. This morning, as we prepare our hearts for worship, we're going, or for uh, for communion, we're going to do some things a little differently. Um, one of the truths of our faith is that we are the body of Christ, and uh, during communion, there is a blessing at the end where we bless the elements and we bless the people. And since you are the body of Christ, today you will be doing that blessing by singing in the singing. Now we sang that about two weeks ago, so it should be a little bit familiar. So you might want to get that uh, hymn ready. It's number what, 2115? 2255. 2255 in your little black hymnal. And so you'll just have that ready. Um, and so I will offer the invitation and the words of institution, and then um, you will bless the elements and, and one another. In the United Methodist Church, the table is open to all. All are loved, all are welcomed, all are accepted. Come to this table to meet the living God. Love indescribable and beyond our imagining yet closer than our own breathing. Come to this table to meet the risen Christ, flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, God with us, embodied in our living. Come to this table to meet the life-giving spirit, interpreting our search for truth and justice, breathing into us renewing power. Come to find, to meet, to hold, the living, loving God, made new for us in bread and wine. On a night when Jesus broke bread with friends, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you break bread, remember me. At the end of the meal, he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant. It is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins, just as I have poured out my life for you. Whenever you drink this, remember me, and know that I am with you always. And now we ask for your blessing on us and on this meal. and the moment of 
of acceptance in the heart's cry in the healing in the circle of your people Jesus Christ Jesus Christ be the wine of grace Jesus Christ Jesus Christ be the bread of peace I'm going to invite those who are helping with communion this morning to come forward The table is set. The invitation is Christ's. Come and dine.
You'll find this morning's closing hymn, in, again, your red hymnal, the, it's number 322, up from the grave he arose. <clears throat> We should stand for this. How did I miss that? <laughs> Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, He tried for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Mainly they watch his bed. Jesus, my Savior, vainly they seal the dead, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives ever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. <clears throat> dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And now receive the benediction. God goes with you wherever you go. All you have to do is be silent and listen. God is there. Go in the peace of Christ to be the resurrection for all you encounter. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>